Hi, I'm Adrian, and I'm from the Software and Systems Engineering Chair at the University of Cologne, which is in Germany. So basically, I'm neither from the UK nor I'm a research software engineer, but still I'm interested in this whole topic. So as a software engineer, this, let's say, more or less age-old question, what is code quality? is more or less clear. I mean, I know what is part of code quality. I know what is more or less important depending on the uh, project at hand. So I, when, I, when we began working in the research, research software engineering area, I thought it must be the same. You know, software engineering is a general principle. We try to generalize so we can uh, adapt to any area. But as it turned out, it's uh, quite not that way. Um, so uh, we asked ourselves in this uh, study, not alone what is code quality for researchers, but also what drives them to adapt certain principles. There are some things that they already do. And what either holds them back to adapt certain other principles that they do not uh, apply yet. So to get an insight on that, we conducted a study, more uh, specific interviews with uh, yeah, researchers we, we invited to our chair. Uh, these were mainly uh, researchers from the University of Cologne and also from some uh, other research institutes within the area. And the interviews were mainly exploratory interviews. It means uh, we wanted to, first of all, get an, an impression and we also conduct them in a senior structured way. So we had some guideline we wanted to stick to, but um, if there were some topics we did not cover yet or some answer of our participants were more interesting, we of course then wanted to duck a little bit deeper into it. Uh, regarding our participants, as I said, they were from the university or close research in institutes. And we also had a variety of positions. So we had PhD students, we had professors and anything in between, and also from different fields, different, different research areas, something like weather uh, forecasting and particle simulation in the atmosphere or something like that. I do not understand anything of. So uh, our interviews were mainly structured in these three parts. First of all, we had the introductory or demographics part where we asked something like, uh, how many participants does your project have? How long are they involved? What is your current position in this project? And so on. Then in the second part, we were a bit more specific about the software engineering or code quality uh, principles, which we mainly, uh, based on uh, the guidelines provided by the Ger German Aerospace Center for research software. I will come to this in a minute. Uh, so these were more general questions, something like, um, what do you know about, let's say, architecture? How important is it to you? And uh, what do you do to, do, to uh, yeah, achieve some kind of architecture and so on? And then in the third part, we uh, asked various project-specific questions uh, based on findings we had from static code analysis of their current research project. Something like, ah, uh, we have seen in general, you have a uh, quite good method length that is within the threshold of this uh, tool we used. But in these specific files, we have seen, ah, uh, your method length is exceeded uh, to uh, a real high edit, uh, magnitude. Uh, why is that? Uh, so uh, we get some insights on why they deviated from their standard behavior. Okay, so this was the overview of the study. And then I will already come to some insights we gained from that. First of all, uh, I want to mention uh, the code quality attributes they mentioned in, within the interviews. So uh, size in this case means how often it occurred. And as you can see, understandability is the most important, or at least it is most often uh, mentioned in the interviews uh, to our participants. On the second layer, we have documentation and method length, with, which is actually some kind of, or it at least contributes to uh, understandability. 
but also something uh, like test coverage, which is uh, an interesting uh, thing because um, we had a wide variety of, of uh, answers in regard of testing. Some did do tests in some way. Some did uh, uh, testing in a very sophisticated way. They had a huge uh, testing pipeline with everything you can imagine. And of course, then the uh, classic, uh, we don't have any tests anymore. That's, I think, even a bit more concerning. And then on the lowest level, which is things they mentioned, but not as often as, as the other things, uh, we have a variety of uh, different things, some also uh, contributing to understandability. And one thing that I found a bit striking is that performance is apparently not as important as understandability, although in previous studies uh, that we found in uh, yeah, reading literature, uh, performance was actually ranked as one of the top four most important uh, uh, quality attributes for researchers. All right, then coming to these guidelines I mentioned earlier, which our main part was based on, these were actually eight common activities from software engineering. And um, yes, the answers to these, these eight uh, activities were quite interesting. So first of all, I think uh, most of, of you already know that requirements engineering is a difficult topic, um, especially because in principle, there are no requirements. Yeah, So you don't know in advance what you want to do with your research project in on a level that we in normal software engineering would expect. Um, in particular, none of our participants really did anything uh, with, with regards to requirements engineering except one, but that is only due to the fact that this person was working on a master thesis. So they conducted some interviews with the people who would, would later use their software, but that's all. So this was the most sophisticated uh, requirements engineering technique that we had as an answer. Then coming to documentation, actually all our particip participants had some kind of documentation, either in the form of code comments or even something like automated documentation generation, but none of them actually did that to an extent that is common in bigger software engineering uh, projects, but still they're all aware of the impact of good documentation and want to improve in different degrees. Then release management. Um, for almost all our participants, release management was not a topic at all because if they create something new, they just push it to their GitHub repository and that's it. Uh, one of our groups, which I uh, always refer to as the good group, um, <laughs> they actually had some kind of release numbering. Yeah? So they can say, okay, here we have some interesting new uh, feature that is actually also uh, interesting for our users, which are mainly other colleagues. Uh, so we give that a version. but. That was all there is to it. So in particular, they have no real plan when to release a specific version. Testing, I already said there was a variety. We had a whole infrastructure. We had none. We had uh, non-existing anymore. And all of these, uh, all of the answers of our participants actually were only concerned with system or unit testing. So something very close to the code but not something like acceptance testing, which is more or less clear since there are no requirements, they, there cannot be a real acceptance test. Architecture, I was actually surprised. All our participants had some kind of architecture. They developed it at some point in time, some years ago or something, and then they never change it again. So once this architecture was done, everything that uh, needed to be included in this project, either had to adapt to this architecture or could not be integrated. 
for coding guidelines, um, all our participants had some kind of coding guidelines. They either took that from the programming language they were using, or they created some kind of own guideline, of course, influenced by some existing guidelines. But uh, no, none of our participants strictly enforced using or adhering to this guideline. So people could still uh, create code in their very own style, integrate that, and then this whole uh, guideline thing uh, does not really make sense anymore. For code reviews, uh, again, a wide variety. Uh, we had uh, in the good group, again, uh, we had uh, very strict code reviews. So everything that uh, needed to be integrated into the main branch needed to be tested. They need to provide test cases and they need to open some pull requests and then someone else reviews that. We had no code reviews, of course. And we had this, this middle thing where the main developer, of course, is always right. So they, of course, review code by others, but uh, they themselves are not reviewed. And finally, automation. Um, most of our participants did not have some more sophisticated automation. Some didn't even use IDEs. Uh, that's that. And again, for the good group, uh, they they had a, a good, actually good chain of automation, but they said alone for using this uh, automation chain, you already need a certain set of skills, which is uh, not uh, beginner friendly and for creating it, it is even more difficult. Okay, and then finally, uh, as I said, we wanted to have some insights on the influences. Uh, that's why we created something that we uh, called with a more or less catchy title, the wishes cycle of research software engineering. And um, four main problems of this cycle uh, that occur everywhere is uh, are no time. So as a researcher, you of course need to focus on your research. You have no time for code creation basically. So let alone uh, for uh, code quality. You have no resources, yeah, so you can't just uh, take some non-existing money and pay some software engineer, for example, to, to uh, work on your research project. We have the problem of insufficient skills. Yeah, All our participants uh, replied that they didn't have a solid background in software engineering and only some kind of programming course that was uh, in the 90s or something. So already uh, out of date. And finally, uh, no systematic onboarding. Yeah, if there are uh, new, particip uh, no, new uh, developers for the project, they basically need to onboard themselves. Uh, our participants said that might even take months. So um, that's a, also a problem. All right, um, so the first major finding uh, in this cycle is we have unclear benefits of software engineering practices. Yeah, As I said, some researchers apply these kind of uh, practices, some researchers apply these kind of practices, uh, and for them, these things are clear, but everything else is rather unclear. So they don't know why should I do that actually. And one thing that yeah heavily influences this uh, thing is that there is no reward and no recognition uh, for you know, their code creation and uh, mm -hmm. quality. So uh, we actually had uh, one reply from a professor that said, when I'm in uh, a commission and uh, I say, well, I have 4,000 hours of code maintenance experience, no one cares. So um, yeah, the, the benefits uh, lie heavily within the research part and not in the software creation part. What then follows is, of course, the quality of code has lower priority. And this, this is actually more or less contradicting to the fact that um, all our participants said this project they're currently working on and that we were, we were talking about is some kind of major asset for them. So um, they use it in teaching and research. And uh, interestingly, also as a foundation in their 
funding applications. Yeah? So if they apply for new research projects, they refer to their, uh, their, um, their existing software projects. Then, as I said, we focus uh, not so much on quality, but rather on results. This is our next step in this cycle. And this is also influenced by the fact that uh, yeah, the software project is mainly driven by the research it serves. Yeah? So that if the research of the um, developers goes in a different direction, the software also grows in this specific direction. So we can not predict uh, how the software will evolve over time. And especially we have no vision then, what is usually in software engineering in general. Uh, we can say in one year ahead, we will have this set of features and uh, these releases. We don't know this. Because of this focus on the results, uh, we have a people software coupling. Yeah, so the developers of the project needed for their research, they needed for their results. So they mainly work on a specific part of this project that serves themselves. And therefore, this specific part of the project becomes uh, more or less only understandable, only maintainable to these developers. And this is a problem because uh, when this, this person leaves the research group or whatever, um, this part of the software is not understandable to anyone else in the, in the team or maintainable, and therefore it just dies. Yeah? So it is not reused again, which uh, is a major idea of software engineering. And um, yeah, this is a problem because I don't know how it is in the UK, but in Germany, uh, we have limited working contracts, for example, at university, so only three to five years, and then you either are a professor or you're gone. And therefore, we know these people will leave at some point, but we, but they, the researchers mainly do nothing to achieve uh, something like reusability. And then finally, um, because of these focus on results, these unclear benefits, and uh, the fact that they are so heavily relying on their research, we have a separation of research software engineering from software engineering. Yeah? Even if they are asked, do you consider yourself as a software engineer? They say, of course not. I'm a researcher. I have almost nothing in common with software engineering. They know more. They don't say what. They do more. They don't say what. Um, but I am not a software engineer. And therefore, because they don't see themselves as software engineers, they again question themselves, why should I do software engineering practices when I'm not a software engineer? And so on. So um, these were the results of our current state of this study. Um, I want to give a brief outlook into the future. Um, because this is actually an ongoing study. So we want to continue doing interviews and uh, we also want to ask you if you're interested in uh, having an interview with us, you might contact me via my email. And we also have another study, which is a survey uh, that is concerned with a slightly different topic. Um, and I see this is actually the older version of the slides. Uh, so I may uh, contact you in another way about it uh, because there should actually be a real QR code. I don't know if this works, you might try, <laughs> but we wanted to ask you to uh, maybe participate in our uh, survey that is concerned with uh, how important certain aspects of code quality are to yourself, to your research environments or your colleagues or other groups in your field. And what do you, what you think uh, this specific topic, like for example, testing, how important it will be in the future. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And now let's come to questions. Thank you. Let's just switch over to Slido quickly. And then after we've done our questions, we have a a procedural announcement as well. I mean, I can do that with Guy and Slido's now.
Yeah, we're getting quick today. <laughs> so the first question we have is, how did you find your participants and how different do you think the responses would be in different communities? So um, we found our participants mainly because we contacted them. Yeah, Some of them were uh, contacts of uh, our professor and some others we just searched for in on the internet uh, and then contacted. Um, and I think the, the, the responses actually, even within this, from my perspective, this, these fields that we covered already are quite similar yet. So uh, weather forecasting and particle simulation is some kind of atmosphere stuff. And already there, the, the, the differences were quite heavy. Yeah? So um, I think even in diff very different uh, research communities, these, the, 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 the um, responses will be even more different. Just before we go on to the next question, I'll say with that QR code, what I'd suggest is if you could drop a link in the um, Slack chat for this session, and then if anyone's interested, they can go and grab the link from there. Yes. So the next question we have, I've heard several people say that the defining factor of RSE versus software engineering is that we don't make production systems. How does that affect how we should think about software engineering practices for research code? So um, actually, uh, the answer to this question is part of our research. Um, so I'm mainly now give my personal uh, point of view. I think um, how does uh, I think this this um, we don't make production systems is I mean it's true, but uh, the research software we or the researchers. Again, I'm not a research software engineer. Uh, develop is more or less, at, at least in today's standards, is more or less their production systems. Yeah. So um, from the groups we interviewed so far, we have seen that they heavily rely on uh, these these uh, yeah, projects, these, these systems even, and. In principle, if they wouldn't have these, these uh, projects, they could not uh, do their research as uh, advanced as they do it today. Um, and yeah, I mean, if we look at it from, from the perspective that we want to, of course, let's say as a researcher, I want to focus on my research. I want to uh, put out new results and maybe even do that as quick as possible. So I want to, to uh, advance in my field as quick as possible, gain new insights as quick as possible. Then the answer to this, because we want to be quick and we want to, uh, to um, yeah, use uh, software because uh, some simulations or something are way too hard to do by hand. Uh, the answer to this is, well, then we should uh, make our code more reusable, more maintainable because then uh, we can build on top of what uh, we achieved earlier. Yeah? So if we have a current state and then um, yeah, if we have a new direction, a new research question, for example, then uh, it, was, it would be a waste of time to uh, yeah, rebuild the whole stuff. Yeah? So I think this is more or less the same idea as uh, in the in the production systems, we want to we take one last one and then hand over for a procedural announcement. Yes, I've almost got a breath back. <laughs> so the last question then is: Did the people you interviewed identify as RSEs, and how many of them were part of an RSE group? Um. So in the in the sense that we think of RSEs, I think so. We we didn't ask them directly, do you identify as research software engineers? Um, I think even if we ask them, they say would say no. Yeah. So they really see themselves as researchers in, I don't know, atmosphere, observation or something, and not as something that is concerned with software engineering. 